the uh, craft center at NC State, or, or NC State pretty much is, um, you know, they, they sent the students home um, or they're on uh, remote classes. The craft center is pretty much closed again, except they will allow us to do, to record and present demos from the craft center if, if we choose to do that. So we don't have anything scheduled yet, but um, we can use it as a studio essentially uh, if we choose to. Um, the, um, actually before I forget, Norm, can you hit the record button? Already did. Okay, good, thanks. Um, for those of you who participated, uh, we had a wood sale uh, a week ago, uh, the wood that we got from Mike Smith. Uh, we sold about half the wood. Um, we doubled our investment, essentially, uh, <clears throat> selling half of it. Um, there's a bunch of spindle blanks left, a lot of three by three by twelves and uh, a few four by fours. Um, uh, and there's a few bowl blanks left, but not many, but we are trying at this point to, um, I've been talking to Mike about getting some more bowl blanks. Uh, we got a couple things cooking with that, uh, nothing firm yet, but what we want to do is get some more replenished bowl blank stock and sometime in the November, probably hopefully in the early November timeframe to do another, another sale. So, um, I, I, we thought it worked very well, uh, what we did was we, you know, we scheduled half hour blocks. Uh, we practiced social distancing, everyone wore masks and uh, we all came away safe. So, um, and uh, again, I think that the, the deals were very good. We got the wood at a good price and we sold it at a good price. And uh, hopefully uh, everybody was happy with what they, what they obtained from there. Um, if anybody does want any spindle blanks in the meantime, uh, just contact either me or Norm, and we will meet you there. Um, you know, if, if if you have a an urgent need before November to to get some, uh, particularly a, a lot of three by threes. And again, there are just a few bowl blanks left. There's some six by sixes and eight by eight by threes um, in in the bowl blanks, but but not a lot. So, if you do have a particular need, all the wood is green. Um, if you if you have a need um, that will happen before November, just uh, I think we have some new members on tonight. Uh, the folks from uh, Piedmont, uh, if, if you wouldn't mind, just introduce yourself real quick. Um, Lan, I see you there. Yeah, I'm here. I joined last month from the group in Greensboro. Okay. Welcome. Who else is from uh, new members? Larry, I think you did. You just joined. Larry Hunter. Yep, yeah. Larry. Larry Hunter. You want to you want to introduce yourself, Larry? You're on mute, Larry. <laughs> unmute. Oh, he's right there, but he's yeah. unmute. Press and hold the space bar. Larry, right, if you just hold your space bar while you talk, we'll be able to hear you. Okay. All right. Got me. Okay, Can't good. Off. Couldn't get off of mute there. Okay. Yeah, if you're on mute, you just hold your space bar. It'll take you off mute. Okay. While, while you're talking. So I uh, just want just, to don't, don't welcome you. Thank you. Good Appreciate to be here with you. Um, anybody else from Piedmont here tonight? Rick Andrews was here, but he seems to have disappeared. Okay. Temporarily, perhaps. All right. Uh, All good right. evening. This is uh, Ron Patterson. I joined last night. Um, okay. From Raleigh area, actually, Rollsville Lake Forest. Okay. Welcome, Ron. Thanks Just got that. in under the wire. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ron. All right. Any other? Uh, I think that's it for new members. Um, let's, uh, Ted, you want to just talk about our next couple of meetings? Sure. So uh, next meeting is next Thursday, which is our show and tell for the month. And so uh, send in uh, a couple of photos of what you've been working on. Doesn't have to be your best work. It can be something you've been had a challenge with and you can talk about how you overcame it or, or if you're still mounting that challenge and wanna maybe get some help or advice from others, um, that's fine too. 
So uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, the best stuff you're doing, but it's kind of nice to see what you're doing right now, you know, and what you're working on. So uh, that's next week and uh, send your photos in by uh, Wednesday to WGNC. Uh, then coming up in October, <clears throat> excuse me, October 8th, we have photography for the wood turners. So John Vaith, who's um, one of our members and many of you probably know John, um, he is a professional photographer and a wood turner both. So that combination is great for us. Uh, we've been working over the last couple of months putting together his demonstration on photography for the wood turner and I think it's excellent. I think you're really, really going to like it. So um, in fact, I think he can probably take that and, and do a national demo on it and get a lot of interest from uh, wood turners across the nation. So they're not, it's not worldwide. So anyways, um, don't miss that. Uh, you'll be disappointed, I'm sure, if you do. And then we'll have the week after that, another show and tell. So every month we'll have a show and tell the week after our meeting. Um, and then coming up in November, we have small projects demo. So uh, we'll have at least two different people doing small projects, maybe up to four. We're still working through that. It's probably gonna be in the format we were discussing earlier where we do videos and uh, they'll be probably fairly short, 20 or 30 minute long videos. We'll play those and stop them intermittently and talk about what's going on and answer questions kind of thing and have the, um, the demonstrator, of course, uh, handling that, the, the answers, the points. And then we'll have another show and tell the week after that. And then December 10th, we have shop tours. And um, we haven't talked about uh, for sure yet if we're going to have anything else in December. I don't have anything slated yet. But we still have some time to decide whether we want to do another show and tell in December or not, um, or with the holiday season, whether it's going to be more than we want to do. But um, anyways, that's the slate right hey, now. Um, One more thing, the October 22nd, that's a Thursday night as well. It's a week after the show and tell. I do have it down right now for a TVD to do a watch party for that week. We haven't selected a video yet, or we haven't confirmed that we're going to do that. But We'll send an announcement out uh, if we, in fact, uh, decide to do that, so you'll know. And the, for you new guys, the watch parties, we, we select a, a demonstration that we recorded on video, either from the D WGNC or some. We used one to, off of YouTube one time. Um, we could use one off AEW, I suppose, as well. And we just play that through. You know, we stop intermittently and and discuss points being made and give different viewpoints on different things and so forth. And uh, they usually are uh, quite uh, interesting and uh, we get quite a bit of good participation on those. So, um, so that makes, you know, if we do that, it's three, three uh, weeks in October that we'll have something going on for you uh, all on Thursday nights, starting on the 8th, the 16th and the 22nd. And then November we'll have the 12th and then the 19th. I guess it is. And then December right now, we just have the December 10th shop tours. Questions? Thanks, Ted. Yep. Um, so just, to, just uh, it occurred to me uh, as we started the meeting tonight. So our meetings will typically, we start at seven o'clock. We will open up the, um, we'll open up the Zoom call at 6.30. So there's a half an hour, half an hour beforehand for people to, uh, to just socialize. And one of the things we really miss about not meeting together is that, is that camaraderie and, and just sharing, you know, the, 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 some of the, the conversations. So, um, so we'll, we'll leave a half an hour before the meetings, each of our meetings. Um, tonight we actually opened it up at 615. Um, but, but you can count on 630 for if our, and we'll start our business at, at seven o'clock. Um, I would like to say that just, received a lot of positive feedback about the, the show and tell we did last month. It was the, the casual banter at that meeting was just a lot of fun. Um, I think everybody, uh, it, it, it really was. And the, you know, the work displayed was nice, but just the fact that it was just so to me somewhat informal, but yet informative. And, and the fact that, you know, the, the, the levity and the jokes and, you know, I just, I thought it was uh, actually resembled something that uh, we might do in person. So, um, 
So, um, and it was all done in, in good taste and good fun. So um, I, I do appreciate that and, and hope we can uh, keep repeating that certainly at our, uh, at the show and tell meetings. So while they're doing it, that may not come through with what you see here presented tonight in the one or two minutes that the, the people are talking about it. So just, uh, just bear that in mind as you look at what's being presented here. And um, um, if you don't feel comfortable doing it or you're not sure whether it's safe or whether it should be done that way, then certainly um, um, don't do it. <laughs> so, but uh, it, it is, uh, there's, a, there's a, again, people, people get a comfort level based on um, the way they approach things and um, um, just, just be careful if you try to, as, as in any demonstration, just be careful as if you try to adapt that to your, um, <laughs> your project. Uh, that's all I have for announcements and business. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and start. Um, I will share my screen. So what we have is um, the, the photos that people sent in. Um, uh, and we'll just take a minute or two on each one and let the person that uh, sent these in um, describe it. And then we'll move to the next. If anybody has any questions, just go ahead and uh, um, we're going to mute everybody, but just press the space bar and you can uh, um, you can ask questions and unmute yourself by by pressing the space bar. So I will share my screen. All right, did that share? Yep. yep. All right, give me one second to. Yeah, part two. So I just need to adjust my screen here. All right, Bob Edmondson. You there? You muted? Bob on? No, Bob uh, said he couldn't. Sorry, I just remembered. Bob said he couldn't make it. So, oh, okay. He had a sense. conflict tonight, but he, right. he provided good text you can read. All right, well, let me move this over so you can. Sorry, one of those things I just remembered as soon as you went looking for him. <laughs> so, it, but what Bob's doing is he's uh, using a hole saw to uh, as a circular scraper in order to uh, in order to uh, create a uh, spherical end or or turn spheres or the I guess spherical bases for some of his boxes that that roll. So, um, but. Uh, Again, this is one of these things that works, but you just have to be really careful doing it. Uh, and so he just, he grinds off the teeth and creates a, uh, a sharp edge on there and, uh, and just runs it on there. And that's the inside, the, the look on the inside. And I believe he's using that screw in the middle just to uh, act to keep it from, uh, acts as a guide. Keep it from yeah, he hit that far. apart. That's how he assembles it onto the handle yeah. actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've seen people that will actually take that and use it as a third point of contact in there. So, so when he's using it, that would be tightened down. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. What's the other little blade there? Do you know what that is? That's actually not a blade. This right here, that's actually the the hole in the side of the that you use in the side of the. Oh, of the, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's that's this thing yeah. here. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I had to look at. Yeah. That. I had to look at that a couple of times to figure I thought that was inside too. <laughs> yeah, got it. it just did, yeah. I'm guessing that would work for sphere making too, wouldn't it? Yeah, there are a lot of people that do that with spheres. And I, my, my, my feeling is it probably works if you're in the larger range of, boy, I'd hate to try that on something too small because I think yeah. it can just catch and throw that thing right out of your hand. So, but um, can you go back and show how he has it on the tool rest? He's got the metal on the rest. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's sharpened. It's beveled, right? It's not square ended. It's sharpened on the side. Yeah, right. I'm going to mention that because in the next picture, it shows a, a bevel from the outside in. Right. right. He yeah. says it cuts on the, from the inside because he, he, right, because he grinds it on the outside. So the sharp shavings come from the inside. Hmm. 
I know this because the first time he sent it, there were no photos about how it was in use. So he explained it to me and took another photo. All right. And this is, um, so this is uh, his maintenance tool for uh, cleaning out his uh, uh, Morse tapers. Morse tape. Looks like he's got a, uh, he just turned a Morse taper on the end of a, of a handle here and just put some fine sandpaper on there and uh, and put puts a slit in the end of it and puts sandpaper in there and uses it to uh, clean out the gunk. All right, Gene, you there? I'm here. This is such a simple thing. I was leery about submitting it. Uh, until I bought a couple of magnets, I spent most of my time just sewing my calipers or my chuck wrench or Allen keys and uh, magnets on my lathe. I just, when I use it, I just slap it right back on the magnet and it's always there. It's never covered up. It's just a simple and easy thing to do. Gene, let me say that uh, I was going to send that in as one of my tips because my lathe has probably a dozen magnets on it for all kinds of little tools or Allen wrenches or whatever. And I put another couple on the cylindrical part of my drill press for some small drills rather than, you know, if I'm going to use them regularly on a project and I'm going to drill a lot of little holes, rather than put them away and take them back on a daily basis, I just snap them right up there on that. So it's, it's a great solution. Yeah. I put them on most of the tools themselves, little magnets. And, and here's, here's a tip. CA glue is good, but it's brittle. So the first bang, it'll fall off. Hot glue is good, but if you work in a hot garage, it'll get soft. The combination of the two is perfect. So I put a drop of CA behind the magnet, surround it with hot glue and they tend to stay on in my environment at least try e600 it'll 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 stay on there and you'll never get it off gotcha <laughs> I've, I've had good luck with a with uh epoxy but again you might want to just look at bigger magnets and that's e6000 isn't it instead of e600 yeah whatever it is it's e6 and a couple it of is zeros, I can, yeah. <laughs> but it does uh, it works it works e600 really well. is a lot cheaper <laughs> it's about, about ten, it's about a tenth of the cost. Uh, Gentlemen, the uh, the rare earth magnets, the cheapest I found is hanging on the wall in the hardware section of Home Depot. It's a ten pack for six bucks. Cheaper than Harbor Freight? Yes, cheaper than Harbor Freight. Those they're honest to God rare earth magnet. All right. All right. And on that yep. note, um, I've got limited space in the garage and trying to weed through all the, uh, all the shavings to find tools got old. I made this thing um, more or less like a music stand with rows of magnets and uh, a tray. I can stand the tools up, find what I need. They don't get lost in the shavings. Raw magnets across the front hangs on to calipers and there's a, a thing at the bottom to hold the chuck. Um, everything I need, I can reach out and grab. There's uh, pegs on the back to hang on to dust masks and the like. It's worked for me. It's been modified over and over. If I had it to do one more time, I'd put thin strips of wood across the back on it and glue the magnets to those because what happens with the large pole gouges is the fat part of the handle hits long before the metal gets uh, grabbed by the magnet. But that I can put out of the way when I don't need it, put it right over beside the lathe when I do and uh, get it whatever I need. I have to ask, what's that dowel with the two ropes on it hanging on the bottom? Um, a bad idea that didn't work. Um, I thought I could just slip the rope through the uh, chuck and hook it there. 
but turned out to be more trouble than it was worth. So I just put another peg on the upright and put the chuck on that. Totally um, better balance that way. The uh, the piece, the wooden piece hanging kind of in the middle there, that matches up to the maximum and minimum spots on the chuck jaws. So I've got a, a little jig right there to um, be sure I don't get the tenons a little too small or a little too big. Gotcha. Thanks, Jeff. Joe? Is Joe here? Is Joe here? What's I the don't deal? believe he is. Deal you know, with people sending stuff in and not. Well, this is one we actually probably could take. We could, uh, I mean, it's obviously a long worth chuck, uh, yep. but we, we may have this, we may have just moved this one to the show and tell because it certainly could be there. That's a lot of work, <laughs> but that has yeah. to be really precise. So, so he's got these pictures of, of the long worth, and then he's he shows he used the router jig actually to cut those. So you have to, one of the challenges with making a Longworth chuck is cutting these arcs and they all need to be the same and um, in the right axis and the right orientation. So he, uh, he I made that. one of those um, on my laser using acrylics and uh, that made it a whole lot easier. But interestingly, it was before I even knew what a Longworth chuck was, it just seemed like an idea that would work. And uh, out of acrylic, it wasn't the strongest thing in the world, but it worked well for what I needed, just uh, very light holding. Yeah, so you need to be real careful with that acrylic because it's so brittle. But uh, yeah, as long as, you, as long as you do a light touch. Yeah, the acrylic is brittle, you're, you're right. And uh, you do have to be very careful with that part. And it's very sharp shrapnel when it comes apart. <laughs> so this is uh, this is uh, this is just showing how he used that router jig, I think, to uh, to as a template. And then this is his template to make the to cut the art using that router jig. So um, so just as an aside, you could do this now with I, I, those of you who saw the uh, demo I did on the on the uh, Paul Howard router jig that you can cut on the lathe, you could actually do this with an indexing wheel and the Paul Howard router jig and cut these, cut these arcs on the, on the lathe um, with that jig. All right, Lan. Yeah, I'm gonna follow the same theme of what everybody else has shown. It's magnets, but instead of small magnets, I used a large one and a plastic jar from Dollar Tree and all of my little tools, I can store it on top of the lathe. And the large magnet, it holds the tips of each of the tools. So, you know, they, they really don't move around. The jar's not gonna tip over and there's enough room in the jar for even storing non-magnetic things too. So I've got everything from screwdrivers to pliers, to forceps, to uh sticks pencils on and on i'm impressed you kept it to one jar yeah well if you look right behind it the one with ca glue also has it <laughs> and it keeps the ca glue from falling over everything gotcha. so so the magnets inside the jar and it and it so it it that's what you use to stick it down to the lathe is that what, what yes is from harbor freight the little three inch magnets are in the bottom yeah. of it Okay. And it's, it's strong enough to hold it, but it doesn't make everything jump out if you want to lift it off of the lathe itself. So right. it works real good because you can move it around to wherever you're working. That's good. Yeah, That's I like brilliant. it. The theme growing here tonight. Yeah. Well, and I continued on here. <laughs> this is something every one of us has. We have the old shelves that we bought from uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever, the little little uh, metal shelves, the real cheap stamped steel ones. Well, when you tear them down, hang one of them on the wall. And the hooks at the top are magnetic from Harbor Freight. 
and then I can hang each of my different grits of sandpaper on it. And they're easy to grab. And of course, we all use that gold sandpaper from Clean Spore, so it's already in strips. And you can hang it and tear off exactly what you need every time. And uh, you're going to have enough room for other things too. What's that? What's that braided thing in the middle there? That's just twisted sandpaper, like when you do spirals. Right. Uh, it's actually, you know, you twist it on the lathe. The guy from England does that that does the uh, the open finials. I can't remember his name now. But he, you just chuck it up and on your lathe and you spin it. And surprisingly, it always twists up with the grit to the outside and it stays there. And then when you want to sand, uh, you've, you've made a handle or whatever with spirals. It does a beautiful job. You can wrap it around it once or twice or just lay it in there straight either way. Hmm. So you just you just take that and how do you so you just take one of those strips and and rotate it on with the it, lathe? Well, I've ripped it down to about three eighths of an inch thick. Right. And then in the uh, just grab it on the lathe and spin it till it tightens up. How many strips together are you wrapping? Uh, depending on what you're doing, because I, I do mostly little uh, spoons and scoops and things like that. So I'll do one long one, and as far as I can reach on the back of my lathe, and then I fold it over twice. And so I have four strands of it, and then you can see the blue at the end is just blue tape, blue painter's tape, mm -hmm. and that helps keep it from untwisting. And it works great on the handles. Wow, hmm. I, I've never, I, I've, I haven't seen that, but that's a really good idea. It's surprise you. Once you try it, you're gonna like it. I promise you. All right, see that? And you thought you were showing magnets, and yet? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing about that is uh, you can also do, use an electric drill and tie the ends to, you know, tie them down at your a vice or something like that, and most definitely. Any length you want. Yeah. Yeah. That's I made I something before. similar to that in a, kind of the hat rack in the, um, you know, in your entrance foyer with the wooden pegs sticking out. And I uh, just finished that. I was going to send that one into, but it's like, you know, didn't get to that. But um, all those little pegs sticking out, I put my belt sander loops on it and have them in order of um, grit. Works nicely. Another great idea. Good. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Sure. So Bob. Bob's not here. I've confirmed with him. I'll, I'll fill in for him. Okay. He's in another meeting. And he's not getting out in time. So if anyone hasn't done this, do it. You can pick up these sanding discs, adhesive back sanding discs for, oh, I don't know. You can pick them up pretty much anywhere. Harbor Freight, everybody's got them. Uh, Bob did 10 inch. I've got some 12 inch. Just get a few of them going, and you have a fantastic uh, disc sander for the lathe. The only tricky part is you need something that'll fit in your tool post that'll give you a nice level plane. This is I use this for squaring off pens, pen blanks all the time. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. You get to control the speed of it. Um, again, Bob used uh, a standard uh, uh, MDF wood on it. You can turn MDF. You definitely want to wear breathing protection when you do it but you can turn it uh, and it stays pretty stable. You can do it with plywood as well. Um, but now he's got a set of three different grits he can slap up there and, and true up pretty much any surface he needs to against a nice flat uh, plane. And then what's he use for on the tool rest there? Well, how do he make it? What's that made up of? Uh, it looks like a dowel that's made to fit his tool rest that he just drilled nice and straight through a piece of plywood. <coughs> hmm. I'm surprised that's steady though. Well, you know, you don't have a lot of force on it. Yeah. So you just got to build it steady and, and uh, periodically check it. Because I've, I've got one that with a steel post. And every once in a while, I look at it and I go, hey, wait a minute. That's a little out of line. I, I take it apart and whack it back in so that it's, it's stable. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I just made a 20-inch. And they do, I don't even use a, a table, a, a rest. But I'll tell you, it turned that thing at about... 50 RPMs and hold something against it. It just eats wood. Yeah. 
Segmenters like it for flattening rings without a rest. Oh, it's fabulous. Does the end of your fingers do really crap? <laughs> <laughs> Jim, I thought yeah, definitely really well under 500 RPM. Well now, Jim, under. where do you get a 20 inch piece of sandpaper? They're about 20 bucks. They're uh, from Klingspor. They really? make a 20 inch uh, disc sander. They, they actually, oh, Jet makes them in uh, wood. Uh, oh, I haven't seen one that big. Oh, yeah, yeah. fabulous. Somebody that has a floor sander will give you their used one and it'd be perfect. Yeah. Jim, That's I a thought, good idea, yeah. Jim, I thought based on our previous conversation, you were going to say you re-geared your lathe to turn it at 7,000. No, no, no. no, that, no, no. Yeah. 7,000 and he has one grit paper. Yeah. Yeah. And no, and no uh, fingers. Yeah. All right. Mike. Okay. Uh, this was a, a originally a brown nose scraper. Just about half inch across, a quarter inch deep. And I, I saw a YouTube by Mike Peace, uh, and, and he actually did this, and I followed his instructions. So when I'm, uh, if I'm doing a bowl using a screw chuck, I like to keep the tail stuck in, uh, all the time. And uh, I can make the uh, recess uh, with this, with the tail stock in. It doesn't get in the way at all. And it's, it's worked great. The only thing, you, you can't go straight in. You have to sort of lift the handle to go in. Otherwise, it'll be a bit grabby. But it works. And I got to thank Mike Peace uh, for uh, doing a video. I'm sure it wasn't his idea, but he, he does give credit to the people that he uh, got the ideas from. So how do you sharpen that? Uh, by hand with a stone. OK. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mike Soleil did one of those on his video too. Oh, is that right? Made one like that. And uh, I've been meaning to do it because I run into the problem constantly. Well, it solves that problem uh, beautifully if, if you like the... Uh, the now, you, you said that you, your blade you made it from, it's a quarter of an inch thick. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering, I was thinking about that, whether if it's too heavy, then you, if you have a smaller... You know, uh, recess, whatever, it would uh, start riding, you know, on the edge, you know, on the not cutting. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, this works fine. You just need to make sure the handle is, is raised. So, yeah, that's not so grabby. Okay. So, you're across the rest at 90 degrees. The rest is probably 45 to a bowl. Yes. The, okay. the, 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 not the rest so can be, your hands. The rest can be uh, parallel to the bowl. But okay. th this thing is 45 degrees on the rest. Yeah. So it works right. well. The next one is, again, Mike Peace uh, has a, a trend air shield, as, as do I. And their battery <coughs> charger is not smart. And they tell you, you know, you charge it overnight, but make sure you take it off because it'll just keep It'll just keep charging. So this is a uh, uh, Tenergy, and uh, he has a he has a pretty good YouTube on it. He's just the model number and everything. I bought that from Amazon for I don't know twenty five bucks or something. Figured out where the positive and the negative were. That's really important. <laughs> uh, and just rewired it so that the uh, original uh, wire that you can see on the, on the very right hand side by the negative lead. That's that stick the charging wire sticks into that. That charging wire also sticks into the helmet. If you don't want to take the battery out of the helmet, you can charge it with the with the battery in the helmet. So either way, this works fine. Good. How does that cut off? I mean, what's there that makes it cut off now? It's inside that energy unit. It's okay, got gotcha. you. It senses when that battery is, is charged and it just trickle charges it from then on. Okay, that makes sense. I thought that was the original part and you added the, the stain. No, I added the, I added, I bought the red part from Amazon. And again, okay. all the specifications and stuff are on Mike Peace, Peace, uh, Peace's uh, website. It's good, it's all a good right. deal. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. 
All right, Norm. Yes, this is me. So uh, I'm in half a garage. I have no room. I don't have a air cleaner. I don't have a big system. I usually lose a leaf blower and the door open. But I've been trying to get a little bit better about staying on top of cleanup as I turn. So I got a, you know, a shop vac. This is not my design. Uh, there are dozens of these. Go on YouTube and look for uh, air uh, vacuum systems. The nice thing about this is the footprint is the footprint of the vacuum. No more, no less. And that's a, I forget, that's a, what, maybe a 20 gallon shop vac, very cheap at Harbor Freight. Sitting on top of it is a uh, five gallon bucket, a couple of them, and a $30, um, Steve, help me, what do they call these things? Dust separators? Yeah, it's a cyclone type thing. Cyclone-like yeah. device, right. And simply the act of spinning the air as it comes in before it goes to the vacuum separates all the heavy shavings out into the bucket. So you don't fill up the vacuum nearly at all. All the heavy stuff goes in there and you don't have to worry about clogging the filter in the vacuum. I've, I've used it, I've emptied it probably about 10 times now and there is barely uh, an eighth of an inch of dust in the vacuum. So it works real well. Um, just PVC fittings and plywood. The uh, nature of most of the rigid shop vacs is they have uh, posts on the on top of the wheels in the bottom meant to hold the armatures, the extension legs but you can also put PVC fittings on them and basically use them as that post to basically create a riser above it and set up this um, piece. I won't go into great detail, so there's a, there's a dozen YouTube videos on how to do it, but it is the best thing because I can basically just vacuum up heavy shavings immediately after making the mess. It saves me a ton of time. The uh, two, two things I wanna add on here is, when you see these things and you see all these PVC fittings, you start adding them up, it's like, oh, $5 for an elbow, seven dollar all these pieces are really expensive most of them have pvc equivalents that are just off by less than an eighth of an inch so it's really easy to buy the nearest but larger pvc fitting put it on your lathe get a scraper and just turn it down to fit you save yourself a ton of money buying a two dollar fitting instead of a five or ten dollar fitting for the most part and basically you can make these things interchangeable um, the other thing is for me, I have no room in my shop. Someday I'll do a, a five minute shop tour, but I can't reach this thing. It's a, so you're looking at the back of my lathe. So how do I turn it on? Well, I'm big on using the uh, Alexa device in my garage. I've got a, a couple of smart plugs and I put this on a smart plug. Now, next question, if you ever work one of these things is when the vacuum goes on, the device can no longer hear me. <laughs> so how do you turn it off? I ended up creating a few routines. So I say vacuum 30, vacuum two, vacuum three, and it basically goes on for that number of seconds or minutes. And I just judge how much time I need to vacuum and it cuts itself off afterwards. Uh, but that was a little, a bit of a problem. The, the voice activated device can't hear you over the sound of a loud vacuum. Uh, but that's it. Oh, so Norm, can you, uh... There's, a, there's an app with a lot of those smart switches um, that gives you manual control of the, of the switches or the outlets. So you could- The ones I buy usually have a button on them, so that's manual. No, but there, there's also an app for your phone, so you'd be able to control it from that. No, I have it, but it, the whole oh. point is I, I can just yell. <laughs> I don't yeah, yell. But, I but you know, when, it, when it's on, you can't yell, right? So right. they, yeah. Hey Norm, I have a, something like that with uh, one of those little dust deputy things. Yep. I have it. I have it hooked to my uh, belt sander, so the, the belt sander goes on, the the vacuum goes on, uh, and I discovered one thing. You said that there's two buckets there. Yes. The dust deputy uses a bucket within a bucket, but I also found that the second bucket's the same as the bottom one. So when they nest together. You got to be like Tarzan to get that thing out, this vacuum pack. So but I don't. Need, I never need to. I just and pick, pull them both out and empty them. Yeah. Well, my bottom one is bolted to a little carrier, so I can wheel it around. Anyway, gotcha. Um, I discovered that rather than turn it into Tarzan, uh, I took a couple paving stones and put them into the bottom of the first bucket to lift it up just enough so there's no vacuum seal on it. Works great. Ah. Okay. Yep, I did the same thing, Alan. I did the same thing. Took me a while to figure it out, too. Damn it. <laughs> okay, thank you. And a little less. Um, 
modern, but uh, Harbor Freight does have a three channel remote switch. And that's what I use on mine. I use it on the, um, my dust collector, my vacuum, and I still have one that I haven't figured out a use for, but they work really well. Great. I have uh, a, so, right. like a vacuum foot switch, and I just, I just, you just tap it, and it goes on, and then you tap it another time, and it goes off. So I just have it down by the on the floor of my lathe, and I just tap it, and uh, my vacuum goes off. I have mine hooked up to my brain, and I just think about turning on the vacuum, uh -huh, and, and, it, sure. and it turns it on, and then I, I think, wow, my shop's clean enough, and it just shuts off. I don't, I don't know why you guys are uh, Oh, I have it. a sensor that, that I'm going to get a sensor that reads the level of dust on the floor. It just takes care of itself in the middle of the night. How's that? That's good. I think this is getting <laughs> really, really, right. really deep tonight. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Norm, tell us about this one. Yeah, all right. Again, uh, stolen idea, not mine. Uh, you go to craft supplies and I forget who the manufacturers, but they make a metal version of this lathe tool stand. Um, and, you know, charge 50 or 60 bucks for it, different sizes. Great idea. I loved it. Saw it years ago and said, well, you know, but I don't need it to be metal. So three quarter plywood and a couple of strips of eighth inch plywood. And I have this tray. The key to this is that it sits between the ways. There's a, you can't see it, but under that first tool is a, is a handle with a T-nut that basically locks it into the tailstock. Mm -hmm. Uh, excuse me, not the tailstock, but the ways. So I can swing it, move it, keep it loose, keep it tight, doesn't matter. It takes all that weight without even blinking. It's not a problem. So the V grooves on the side, let me throw some big tools down there and some holes drilled in the center. Let me put smaller tools, smaller meaning the shaft diameter. And I can keep, you know, clearly way too many tools handy instead of having to go hunt for them. Yeah, was that the T-Rex or something like that? Thing? It, I, I, I had to go looking for who it was. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't T, it might be T-Rex. Or, with or Raptor or something like that. I can't Raptor. Remember. It was yeah. Raptor. Yeah. Okay. There's this orange made out of steel. Wonderful right. idea, but a simple design. All right. Thank you. Ed, this one's yours. Yeah, that one's mine. So, um, there's a couple things in there uh, that I was wanted to point out. The one is, uh, I actually have it here with me. So um, you can see it here. Oh, let me change my background. Sorry. Oh, background it because it doesn't fade in and out that way. There you go. So anyways, this is um, an air nozzle from Home Depot and I use this for hollowing and uh, you can buy these extension tubes. Uh, from them, they're they're. Hey, only you like... want to stop sharing for a moment so he'll go a bit full screen? Yeah, that'd be good. Or you can just uh, pin me. I think too. Now uh, you guys see me now? Yep. Okay, so you can buy this these extension tubes from Home Depot. It's Husky, and uh, you can you can buy this nozzle. This is separate. I think I, it's frozen on there for some reason, but. Normally they get it so that you put this tube on here and then this flow pipe, it's got a hole in it here. So it uses, um, what do you call it? Uh, Centur Centuri Force. Venturi. 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 Venturi, thank you, uh, to pull extra air in. But if you're already inside the vessel, you don't want that. So I tap the end of this with a quarter inch pipe thread, which is what this is. And then I can screw it in here. And you can put as many on as you, you want, but this, this is all I ever use because that goes deep enough for what most of what I'm doing. So the Venturi is coming through here and it's sucking in extra air. And this can, you can put into the bottom of your vessel then, your hollowing vessel. So it's blowing back here instead of the front of it and all the sawdust comes flying out that way. Especially if you have a small hole, which I, you know, uh, you're hollowing. You know, if you have a one inch hole, um, it's really hard to get stuff out of it, but you put this in there and uh, it comes through really quite well. So, and it's, um, I think this is like six or seven bucks for the nozzle and it's three or four bucks to buy the extension tube, something like that. And then you got to tap out this piece here because I don't know why they don't do it, but they don't, they don't tap this piece out because they're looking at this being on the end, but I put it here on the handle instead. 
So that's one. Uh, this is just a, I'm sure you guys, a lot of you probably made these little measuring device and I don't know if you can see, I've got the, let me turn the light over here a little bit more. I just marked it off in inches across there, just a little bolt through a piece of wood and that's it. And I use this again in my hollowing pieces so I know what my depth is. I can just shove it in there, tighten up my nozzle like that and pull it out and I got a reading and then I can put it on the end of my piece where the, where the hole is. I don't have one here by me to show you, but, and then this comes out right at the, on the outside of it so I can see exactly where the bottom of my hollow form is on that. So it's real quick and easy. Just loosen this up, stick it in there, sh shove it up there till it's tight, tighten up the nut, pull it out, put it at the end of the opening of the hollow form, and I can see exactly where the end, how deep I am on it. Uh, and I use this a lot for when I'm cutting off because I don't, you know, I want to cut it off so it's like a quarter of an inch depth bottom and you don't want to be any much closer than that or, you, <laughs> you know, you don't have a bottom left in it anymore. So that's that. Um, I think there's a, the next one actually I had. Why don't, um, why don't you save it for overflow? Yeah, okay. Yep, go ahead and move on. Unless there's any questions. All right. All right. This one's mine. So, in addition to turning, I still do a, a lot of other work. Share your screen my, again, uh, Steve. Uh, 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 let's see. Why isn't it sharing? Oh, how about now? Can you see it yep. now? Yep. Yep. All right. Um, I, you know, my shop. I do things other than turning. I still do a lot of home repairs and build some cabinets and stuff. So, um, there's a lot of cordless tools, uh, particularly. I have two drills and a nut driver there. Uh, I use the, the impact driver for putting on face plates with hex screws and it has saved my the torque on my wrist uh, considerably. If anybody's still putting screws in with a drill, you really should invest in, a, uh, in, a, in an impact uh, driver. Uh, they're not very expensive. And um, so I just, I just, I got tired of looking for them. So I just have this little stand I built to, uh, to hold them up there on my bench. Um, and, and in the course of, um, just buying various tools that come with batteries and, you know, you end up collecting a, a bunch of batteries and I built this little charging station for my batteries. Um, uh, and this sits below my bench on a, uh, the side of a cabinet. So it's out of the way. And, um, one of the things I did was, you know, these are smart chargers and supposedly they shut off when the batteries charge. But with the number of batteries I have and the amount that I use, I typically, I mean, I hardly, I rotate through the batteries, but, um, and these are all lithium ion batteries, but um, I, I hook this up, go back to this picture. There's a, that charging station comes through a timer here uh, that is only on for an hour a day. And with the number of batteries that I have, that's not, they only take an hour to charge. So, um, so you know, if I forget to take it out of the charger, I have enough spaces there that I can take them out of the, but that's, it, it, I find that it, it really preserves the battery and also saves electricity that, you know, you don't have uh, uh, any current running through these chargers when you're not using them. So if I'm doing something where I know I'm gonna be using it a lot more, like if I'm using my circular saw, the same batteries on my circular saw or reciprocating saw, um, I, I'll, I'll just bypass that timer, but typically um, uh, just an hour a day and, you know, I'm not, I don't go anywhere new, you know, through these. Um, so that's just a, uh, just a little shop organization. Um, next thing I want to show is, um, so I make, I do make pepper mills um, and I use the crush grind mechanism uh, for all my pepper mills, which I really like because first of all, I think it's a great mechanism and you don't have to worry about any corrosion if you use it with salt. Um, and there's no knob that comes, there's no shaft that comes through the top. So you have more design opportunities to not have to worry about that. One of the things I don't like about it is this little white insert right here is all that really fits, that, that fits into the top of your mating piece. And sometimes it's a, a little bit of a sloppy fit just because it's not, it's just not very deep. It's only about, uh, about three sixteenths of an inch. Uh, and you don't want to put a tenon on there because you don't want to waste the wood. So what I do, if you look at the, uh, the one on the right here, is I just, I drill an oversized hole. I put a piece of maple in there. And um, again, I, I just make these, these inserts um, in quantity when I'm, so I, while I'm making them. 
and then I go ahead and I drill that insert out for the uh, for the, the the piece of the crush grind mechanism, and then it gives me a much deeper hole here on the top um, to put the pepper mill in. So what that allows me to do is um, I can turn the whole pepper mill as one unit because there's enough here to hold it together while I'm turning it. Um, and again, I, I do I, when I'm making pepper mills, I usually make ten at a time just to just to, because I go in production. But I just this is the uh, piece I put in the in my chuck to hold the bottom of the pepper mill. This is this is the whole size in the bottom. But what it allows me to do is to take that whole thing and turn it as a unit on the lathe. So you don't have to worry about alignment and you can see where your grain is. And by doing all this, the only thing I lose out of the length of this is the, uh, the, the, the sixteenth of an inch I use up for my parting tool when I part these things off. So you can see how well the grain matches there. Um, but again, it's, it's turned as one whole unit. I leave a little bit extra on the top and then I, um, I, just, I just grind that off when I take the tailstock off. But it's just one, one operation to turn the whole thing. Questions? All right. Ted, I believe this is yours also, right? Yeah. I thought we were going to leave that go to roll over, so. All right. Well, uh, I'll tell you, it's well, now. We, we thought your only your other image was many, a one thing. How many not a more? Two thing. How many more do you have, or is that? Uh, go ahead, just 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 go through this quick, Ted. Well, I think okay. We'll... So it's just uh, this is a circle cutter, so um, it fits on top of the of the bandsaw, and there's a, a way cut in it. If you, you see the way at the right end there of the bandsaw table, and there's a little slat uh, glued on the bottom of this this uh, base, this jig here. And then if you look at the far left end, you see this, this board on the end, which is a stop. And it stops me from going in any deeper than that blade to that line right there. So if you see where the blade is, you'll see a dark line right in front of it. And that's the center of all the holes coming out on the board. And so, you know, you got it marked there, uh, four inch, six inch, eight inch, so forth and so on. And then be in between it is the odd sizes. And then this is a five, six inch in bolt that I cut off that's about you know, an inch long. And I drill a hole in the bottom of my piece. And uh, you know, if I'm gonna use a, 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 a screw chuck uh, uh, for the start the bowl off, then uh, I drill a hole in the bottom of the, the piece that's 5 16 you know, in the center. Then to drop this pin in the hole of that and then put it in the whatever size it is there. I pull this, I got to pull the jig out, you know, so you're out away from the blade, drop that in the pin I want, start the bandsaw up, then, then I just hold the piece and I shove in on my, with my waist, my body actually on this front piece right here until it stops and it automatically stops so that it's right at the front of that blade right there. And then I just spin the piece and I'm done. Pull it back out and take it off. And I can do like, Steve was just talking, I might be doing, a, you know, three or four bowls or something. I can do them all at one time on there. And uh, it's fairly quick. It takes less than, you know, once I have the hole in it, it takes, what, 10, 15 seconds to spin it out. And I well, get a nice, nice circle. sometimes when you get a really big piece of wood, it might take a little longer. Maybe a little bit, but uh, it doesn't take very long at all. It, it, it cut, it's a remarkable how much faster you can do it when yeah. it's held steady like that versus doing it by hand. Uh, I can do it in less than, much less than half the time being held steady like this than I can do it by hand. Um, so small. anyways, um, there's some improvements to it. And then that's the second part of it is that I made, um, I made a little piece, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, it's got a couple of dowels in the bottom of it that fit in those drill holes for the bowl. And it just sits on there like that if I want to cut a half log off, you know, Cutting one like that, just going across the saw, if you're, you know, this is one split in half, but you might have a whole log, right? Uh, is very dangerous, as a lot of you may know, because you're not holding it steady. You're getting too far away from the blade with support. So I put this in those holes so it's nice and steady on that board. Again, I could put my waist up against the, the front of that, that jig, put this piece on there, and then the other piece is free floating. So I just shove that in 
alongside of it, whatever, however big the log is, it, it sandwiches it. So now I got it supported on all, all edges like this, you know, or put it in there like that. So my log is going in there and run it through the bandsaw to cut it off straight. And uh, it's nice, it's safe. And uh, if you don't have a, what is it, a Carter jig, which I actually have now, but if you don't have one of it, I didn't have one before, you can make something like this and it's a uh, dual purpose. It doesn't take very much to make, make one of these rigs. Ted, I have a stupid question. Yeah. If it's a half log, why don't you just put it face down so that it's yeah, support? Oh, it, yeah, and, I, and you're right. You, you can just do that. It, it's really if you, I called it a half log, I know when I sent it to you, but it's really when you've got a full oh, log. Oh, for a round log. Yeah, if you can't put it on gotcha. the flat. Yeah, if you can put it on the flat, it's perfectly safe, as you know, because you're supported underneath the blade at all times. But if it's rounded, if you have a rounded piece, maybe you have a, a full a, log that you've already turned and you want to cut it off, you know, you can use it for that as well. I bought Perfectly. one of those Carter uh, holders, you know, that kind of like what you have, Ted. Yeah. And I discovered three or four design flaws in it, which I shared with Carter and nobody replied to me. The, the teeth are both pointed in such a way as to, the teeth should be pointed like up on one side and down on the other, and they're not. So it doesn't really prevent spinning, and the knobs are hard to get to. But yeah, you know they designed it; they love it. Yeah, I I agree with you on on that um, on that one. It's probably safer than what I have to some ex extent. Yeah. But um, I've used this one for for a few years, and it works great for most of the stuff I'm doing. But I do have one of those Carter jigs now too. Yeah. Yeah, Ted, right. it's, it's amazing because mine looks almost exactly like yours for the uh, cutting the bowl circles, yeah. except I'll put a stop in the uh, end of the, the uh, miter gauge slot, but what you have is uh, actually much better. And then the dual purpose uh, for the log is very good too. But it's amazing. We we uh, need to do the same thing, and we put our brains at it, and we end up with the things that look very similar. Yeah. In fact, I uh, discussed it with Carter uh, at the NCN uh, symposium, and uh, theirs looked a lot like what we have. It's just uh, fancier materials, but. Uh, that's very cool. You know you have a good idea when somebody else has the same one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Jim. Mm, this is different. Uh, this, this is, is the bottom of a tailstock of a 3520A, Powermatic 3520A. I got tired of lifting my tailstock on and off, and uh, Powermatic makes this fancy little hinge that's a it's about a $60 hinge painted yellow with, and you get $300 for it. But uh, I decided that was too too much monkeying around too. And it only hinges it out of the way. This on the bottom of the tailstock is a round washer. I cut the sides off of the washer and made it so that it fits up between the waves of the lathe. And the rod that comes off of this goes out through the back of the tailstock with a uh, bloodwood handle on it. And uh, when you, you open the, you actually unlock the tailstock, pull that handle, and then lock it again. That brings this washer up between the waves of the lathe. And then the next picture. That's, that's in the lock position on the lathe. Next picture. Oh, you see that spring? Yeah. And, and the next picture, okay. see that spring? I had, I had to have a real small spring that had almost no tension that held that thing just perfect so it, it can't vibrate out and become loose. And uh, that's the spring out of the middle of the toilet paper holder. You know, the little <laughs> rod? DMI. Uh, anyway. It took a while to find that. We can't it, find toilet paper, so we just as well use the springs <laughs> and the holders. The you got the other picture? These are, these are, no, there's another picture, too. 
one, one more. There's a picture of it on the lathe. Here it is on the lathe. On the lathe, you unlo unloosen the, the locking mechanism, you pull the handle out, and then you relock it. And that's the way it is now. That has brought, that has indexed the washer 90 degrees and brought it up in between the ways. And then on the top of the tailstock, you see there's a 3 8 eye bolt tapped into there. And uh, there's another picture of the hook and uh, somewhere. Here it is. That's what we should have started with. Anyway, here's the tailstock in an unlocked position. And it, the handle is in so that the index, the washer is indexed to lock that tailstock just like a normal tailstock. You lift this up, pull the handle out, and lock it. And then on the top, it's an eye bolt. And then over on the wall, you see that cable with the red ring around it? Then unhooks off that hook and just slips into this uh, eye bolt. And you press the button on the top of that uh, yellow handle, that control switch, and then show the winch. Go back one. No, back one. Okay. Another yeah. one. Another one. There it is. You press that button, and the winch, and the whole tailstock goes straight up. Um, the winch is from Harbor Freight, costs about ninety bucks, and the whole thing probably cost me I I don't know under a hundred dollars, and it's totally out of the way. Do you wear a hard hat? No. Nope. <laughs> yeah. The, the, winch is, the winch is good for over 500 pounds. It, it just take the thing weighs about 80 pounds, but yeah. I'll tell you when you do this all day, you know, it, it's, you lift that thing on and off of there 20 times a day and, and you've had enough of that stuff. But uh, no, that, that's really, that's, that's very, very, that's the most, in, it's the most ingenious one I've seen. Well, I'm yeah. sure Powermatic's not going to put it out, but no, uh, Jim, how many times have you hit your head on that thing? Oh no, it goes all the way up. Or, or if you don't like it, you can you can coast it over. It'll sit on the floor. You can set it on the floor too. Oh, I see. Set it. I down just run it straight up and leave it hanging. Yeah. Here. yeah. It hangs there for days. <laughs> Was the alternate plan a mechanism that would lower the lathe? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but if you don't pull the handle, it lifts the lathe off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure. If that thing is really bolted into the ceiling, or it'd come down into the head. But that would be a little it, more expensive to lower the lathe. Though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is kind of interesting. This next, well, if you want to see, if you got time, you want to sure. see. Sure. No, okay, go ahead. Okay. This is a Jimway lathe. Um, when you get a 3520A, the original Powermatic lathe had a, a belt changing door on here. It had a screw on it that was like an inch and a half long, and you had to unscrew the whole damn thing to get in to change the belts. So I threw the door away, made a plastic door, and on the top is a, a button magnet that just glues on there. And uh, so all you do is flip that. First off, you can see what what speed you're on. I'm always changing speed. So you can see what speed you're on without monkeying around opening the door. Uh, all my lathes have wooden handles on them. They're, it's much easier to use. You get a little longer handle. Uh, it, it just works better. You don't have to lean on it to tighten it. it. It just gives you a better way of doing things. Behind is a dust collector. That, that's the rod that that cage came on. There's a four inch round elbow hanging on there with a, a wing nut tapped into a, a tube and I can adjust that back and forth or remove the whole thing. On the end of the tailstock, you'll see a, 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 a turbine. And if you see over on the wall, is there another shot of that? Go, go back to the next shot. Oh, uh, hold oh. on, let me, let me go back the other way, hold on. Here it is. Um, over on the wall is an air hose. D did you ever have a job where you had to run that thing in and out like 3,000 times? And <laughs> All I do is spin that and hit it with the air hose, and that thing runs out just as nice, probably about 400 RPM. Oh my. Surprised, you haven't surprised you haven't motorized it, Jim. No, this is better because it, it can't hang up or anything. <laughs> uh, Go back good. to the front first picture, that first picture. That one? That one. Yeah. Uh, there's a red button, uh, uh, 
well, you, the red button on the lathe is the start and stop it. But over on the uh, right hand side, there's another one on a magnet on a handy box. That's a remote on off switch. And if you'll see underneath there, there's a plug, base plug. All of my equipment is wired. So I have one wire goes to the wall and plugs in. But and I can plug in anything to both sides of this lathe. Next to there is a three, a three socket uh, phono plugs. And this uh, remote switch actually plugs into there. I also can plug in a foot switch. I also can plug in the same kind of switch that's a momentary switch. So when I'm drilling, I can hold the chuck and the tailstock, the, the hand wheel, and drill. All I do to turn the lathe on is lean against that button. And, and when I back up, it goes off. So uh, it really works. And below there's a, a shelf with a, a gr an old granite top. Uh, about an inch and a half of granite on it. So it holds it down. Keep those, are, those are 20 inch discs sitting on the floor there? And that's my 20 inch disc, yes, yeah, sitting, sitting on the floor, yeah. So what, I really, what I really like is that stripe on the wall because I have the exact same stripe, but mine's behind my lathe. <laughs> you should have seen the nice white uh, patch that was in there a few months, <laughs> months ago. Uh, I was turning a book and the jig came loose and the counterweight went through the wall and the book went the other way. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's. Uh, you run it. I think that's it. Uh, if you go another picture, I think that's the last one. And unless we must are in the, they're not in the right order here. So uh, of the whole thing, uh, yeah, nice. right there, there. That's good. Behind the tailstock hanging up on the ceiling, that's a fan with a hood over it to suck the uh, air out. And th that's a guillotine on the side that shuts it off if I, like in the winter time when I don't want any air leaking through it, there's a shutter on the outside, but it's not very tight, so. Right. Anyway. That, that just exhausts right outside? Yes, yeah. Hmm. Wow. Uh, inventor, you're very. No, oh, yeah. Very, very, uh, very clever, Jim. Anyway. The neighbor wonders what that dust is on their car, right? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we got. I think we have enough time to do these few uh, these few extras in here. Uh, Joe, did I see you come on? We, we yes, missed you. I'm here. I'm All here. Right. Uh, this is uh, another drill holder. Uh, most of us have a few drills, and basically, you just look at your drill chuck and you drill concentric holes with appropriately sized. Uh, Fossner bits and it's angled at about seven and a half degrees and the drills stay in there very very compactly and they stay in place. Very simple just use um, I guess two two sections of uh, two by four or maybe one board that's not as thick depending on depending on your drill. And um, if you have something else that doesn't have a chuck, like an impact wrench, you can do the same thing and just size one hole uh, to fit the bit or the, the, the bit extender that you have in, in, the, uh, in the impact wrench. All right, good. Uh, this is me. These are Amazon purchase silica gels for drying. They're, they work great for boxes, small hollow forms. They also can work on bowls. So these beads absorb moisture. You, you, uh, you rough turn, fill the inside with beads. They start out orange and they gradually turn to green and blue as they absorb moisture. When they're fully green or blue, they basically can't hold any more moisture. So the problem when you're rough turning is the, you, the outside's been exposed for a while. The inside has just been exposed and you do want that to dry. But if the outside of the form dries as well, it will shrink and really crack. So the tough thing that this helps with is getting the inside to dry at a, at a faster pace. Uh, in North Carolina, the main lesson is if you use this stuff, you have to seal the container because the ambient moisture, if you're not in your air conditioned house, is gonna make it all at the mouth look blue. And I've done this before and I've, I know my, oh, it's already, it's already gone off, so I'll empty it out. And you empty out the first two inches and you realize that only those first two inches went blue. 
from the moisture and the, the humidity in the air. But it works real, real well. Um, basically, uh, overnight, it, it takes me dry for a lot of things. If it's a really big piece, I may do it overnight when it turns blue, dump it out, find you know what's orange, put the orange back in, put some fresh stuff in. Uh, I, I can't remember what I paid. It was no more than 20 or 30 bucks. And here's the key. This stuff's reusable. You throw it in a cookie sheet and, and bake it for an hour at 250. I mean, the, the details are on the back of the uh, thing. And this stuff is fresh and ready to go again. So you can reuse it many, many times. And it's food safe. Now you do, do you do that in your wife's baking oven? Shh. <laughs> it's food safe. Did I say that it's food safe? <laughs> Where'd you buy that again? Amazon. All right. I think Bob's not here, but it looks like a... Uh... De another depth gauge, homemade depth gauge that he's made. Yeah. Hey, it says Joe's on. Can we go back to his uh, Longworth? Oh, Longworth, Chuck. Yeah. Chuck? Uh, let's get through these and we'll see whether I'll see. What okay. Back there. Uh, another one from Bob at this cart that he uh, looks like I think he got it from IKEA. Um, but yeah, just a. a Utility yeah. card in this shop. There's there's Bob's Raptor knockoff. <laughs> he uses magnets magnet on the back of his. Yeah, I, I I I really like using the Thompson handles in my shop, so I don't have much. They don't I don't have much as much problem with the, them rolling off the lathe. I think that's probably the biggest advantage I see of those is that they uh, I can put them on my bed and they usually stay there. So um, um, this is mine. This is a, a repurposed, uh, um, I had a, an old drill that had a keyless chuck on it uh, that I was uh, getting rid of. So I took the chuck off. Um, it had a metric thread on the inside of the chuck, a female thread. And I went to the hardware store and bought a bolt that it was about it was about three eighths of an inch, but it was a, a metric fine thread. And you know, you go to True Value and they have those bins in the back where they have thousands of different things in them and they, it's amazing what you can what they have they have almost every size bolt you can get but anyway it was a metric fine thread i found that bolt cut the head off it uh turned a handle and uh just put it on there and there's a lot of times doing hollow forms and things where you just want to drill a hole you don't want to put a chuck in the uh in your tailstock and this just i just leave this set up and i got a drill bit in it most of the time and and I turn the handle such that it has indents for two hands. So uh, you can put both hands on it and, and get a good grip on it. Hmm. Could you do that with a wood tenon if it were a good, good solid wood? Or do you really need the extra metal parts? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, again, I had this, this worked and it, it, you know, you have to be careful that, you know, you put any kind of torque on it that it doesn't spin. So by putting, you know, I think there's about three inches of bolt into that handle that I roughed. I just sanded that the bolt and then just epoxied it in. So I, I would worry with a wood tenon that you might twist it off, but um, I, that probably that probably depends on the wood. Um, here's another one of mine. So there's a lot of discussion about gloves and the use of gloves when you turn. Um, with the acrylic work that I do in particular, uh, you have to wear a glove or you you will braid your hands away um and what i found is you know you don't want to use a, a like a work glove uh you want a glove that that is very tight to your hand and also um is not very strong you want a glove that's fairly weak and what i found is that sports gloves work the the one on the right is a racquetball glove it's a left-handed racquetball glove um that i actually got from a friend of mine um that was left-handed uh and the one on the, 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 the package on the left, I was in Costco a couple weeks ago and for $12, um, they had a package of three um, golf gloves. So, it, it, so they're what, four bucks each or something like that. So, and again, they're, they're weak enough that if you were to get a catch on these things that they will tear away, they're not gonna tear your hand, uh, you know, or, or take your hand into the lathe. So, um, and they also fit very, very snugly to your hand. So it's just the way I do it, obviously there's a, somewhat controversial wear gloves but the one thing you don't want to do is have a floppy glove or a glove like a leather glove that is too strong because if it should catch 
you want it to you want it to be able to tear away from your hand. Um, and this is the last one. I, so, you know, what happens when you uh, when you have a gouge, a, particularly a bowl gouge? This is a five eighths bowl gouge that I use a lot, and I've gotten to the point with my varicose grind that I've reached the end of the flu, and um, so I can't I can't use the jig anymore to sharpen it. Um, I've tried grinding additional flats on it to try to lengthen it, but that I, it's hard to get those accurate. So what I did is I just, I reground it into a, uh, a bottom feeder. And the advantage of that is that you don't need a jig to sharpen it. You just sharpen it, uh, um, you know, just, just like that on the jig, on the, on the route. So it allows you to uh, just repurpose that, that gouge into uh, one that I can use with the, uh, without the very grind. And let's see. Okay, let me get, let me get. To, yeah, go ahead. Can you back up a little bit? Yeah. Whoa, right there. Yeah, um, I do the same thing. See the uh, magnets down there on the uh, on the jig holder. Um, I do much the same. Those iron filings, the stuff that comes off those tools, that stuff's not safe to breed. Neither is the dust off the uh, wheels. Um, those things are great. No, I have a few of them. You just had to stay with the magnet theme, right, Jeff? Yeah, I uh, I actually put a magnet on the uh, leading edge of the uh, tool holder too, and it it big time cakes up some steel shavings. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Steve, you only use a glove on your left hand. Uh, yeah, uh, ninety nine percent of the time, Jim. Occasionally, um, I will, and I have because I play racquetball. I have right handed gloves. Um, from you know my old gloves from racquetball, I have a couple sitting around the shop, but um, I, I rarely use it. Um, and I, 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 so, um, it, but why do you use one on your right hand also? No, I hardly ever use gloves, but it, yeah. I just wondered. Yeah, my right hand. Yeah, my right hand's usually far enough away. The the oh. one time I'll use a hand. Sometimes if I'm sanding a lot, I, I'll just use it just to just to keep from getting blisters, but most of the time it's just my left hand. Steve, All I right. turned off your sharing. What? I turned off your screen sharing. Why did you do that? I didn't mean to. <laughs> All right, let me uh, go back and share this. All right. All right, Joe. Ah, long arc chalk. So this is very, actually very easy to make um, and it doesn't require much in terms of materials. Um, with a quarter sheet of plywood you could make a very large one, uh, two 24 inch circles depending on the capacity of your lathe. This one is a little bit smaller as you can see. It's um, probably I guess about 13 and a half, 14 inches. Uh, would be the about the largest bowl it can accommodate down to uh, there's another photo um no but i, I didn't was it collapsed oh is that the only one you have yeah we didn't i i, I showed the necessary photos so some oh, okay. photos okay. um so basically the 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 two discs rotate and uh the the bumpers which are attached to bolts will slide in and out uh, to accommodate different bowl sizes. It's reasonably strong. I would, I would say it's, it's for light duty. I, I finished the bottom of one, one bowl with it um, about uh, 12, 12 and a half inches in diameter and it seemed to hold it very well. I wasn't turning it at a very high speed around 400 RPM. And you know I was able to easily remove the the tenon from the bottom of the ball and do a little decoration on the bottom and it worked out fine um i'm just trying to think of as, as far as um making it um there's a uh it's it, it may look complicated but but it really isn't the the arcs are all one dimension so you would you would need some type of um, guide for a router. And now you have that photo, I think, in there, Norm. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so there's a there's a router guide. Um, I have an ancient router um, that has a plastic piece 
on the bottom and you, I just removed that and made a, a template. And, you know, basically that, that is just used to cut the arcs. Unfortunately, the, the lines on this don't show up really well. They were done in pencil. Um, but basically you just lay out a series of circles and um, you also lay out, um, I guess, eight, eight axes at 45 degrees. And you use the, the intersections to position a compass and just draw the, the eight arcs that you would need. Again, it's all one dimension. And then using the, um, the guy that you saw on the previous page attached to your router, you set that one length and you cut all the arcs. So when you do that, you have the two pieces that you're gonna to use to make the disc sandwiched together. And in this case, I use three quarter inch plywood. So you're going through one and a half inches with your router. So you take um, several cuts to cut each arc. And then when you're done, you unscrew the, the two discs and flip one over. And that's how you get the opposing arc. So I'm leaving quite a few steps out, but there's a very good video um, that uh, explains the procedure and, you know, I'd be happy to have a more detailed discussion with anyone that's, that's interested in trying to make one of these. It's, it's not difficult, they're not difficult to make and, you know, it's, it's an alternative to um, using an expensive vacuum chuck doesn't obviously it doesn't have the strength of the vacuum chuck but you can still do quite quite a bit with it hey, and joe i got a question for you um now i've seen some of them where every other slot is not carved out as close to the inner circle as what you have and i'm what because i'm looking at the distance between so, the the end of the one arc and the well, maybe the third the way up the other is it's only like a half of an inch or so. So that seems like a weak point, you know, in that. Uh, um, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know maybe. if it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is, yeah, potentially. I wouldn't be a weak yes, point, but that's that, also when you have the smallest diameter. Uh, yeah. Piece. Yeah. And I would guess the uh, the full connection, as you work your way out the diameter, you have so much more wood there uh, that that would still lend it enough strength. Yeah. That's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, yeah especially at uh, three, three quarter, quarter inch. Plywood is, is pretty hefty, so. Both the front and the back are three quarter? Yes. Yeah, he's got plenty of wood. <laughs> yeah, that's not, yeah, inch and a half. I think you're probably good. So. Yeah, I didn't know if that's why they did it. I see some of them are shorter slots, and some yours is longer. And this was wondering. And I, I just why. tried to, you know, I I was going for the 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 most variation and stuff. Yeah. So. And the the rubber grommets, did you use uh, from uh, Home Depot? Yeah, they're, they're just it's just standard. Um, I think they call them rubber bumpers. Yeah, and again in the in the, the the YouTube video, and I can post the link. Um, it, it's a little bit tiring to, to to watch the half hour video, but he does a good job of explaining everything. The only thing I would I would do different um, that I did do different from from the video is um, drilling a center point or drill for the for the pivot. Um, the the way I did it, um, I. I cut the circles on a bandsaw and um, mounted the mounted my faceplate on one of them, then screwed the two circles together, put it on the put it on the lathe and, and turned them so they were true. And then I used a drill bit attached to a chuck in the in the tailstock to mark the center point. So then you know, you have the, the, the chalk positioned appropriately on the lathe and you're, and you're catching the center point. You just don't want to, you just don't want to drill too far, just enough to, to give you an indication and then you can use your compass to, to set up all the, um, the intersecting points that you need and draw the arcs. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then you have a, a dowel rod in the center. Yeah, I, use, I use the dowel for the pivot. Um, I think I would use uh, probably an aluminum rod instead for, for the next one. I think that's a little more accurate. Yeah, uh, I saw one with a bolt. They had a bolt I wouldn't use, it. um, it's the threaded, threaded bolt. Well, or? it must have been a shouldered bolt, I'm yeah. guessing, you know. But sometimes the, the diameter of those can vary a little bit. So yeah. I don't know if I, I use that. Um, but yeah, dowel was, was not, not the best choice. All right. Thanks. Thanks, okay. Jay. I really like the uh, the holes between the screws, just being able to tighten to yep. move it with fingers. Yeah, it's, yeah. I made I made one um, out of uh, quarter inch uh, acrylic, and uh, that was my problem. I didn't have anything to grab to yeah. to tighten it up. But uh, that, that's, that's gonna, very good. It certainly helps. Um, and then you can chamfer the chamfer the tops a little bit. Just do you find the acrylic one uh, is a little too uh, wavy, Ella? Not on the laser. I mean, the laser is no. Very... I mean, the finished piece is it stable enough for you? Yeah, as long as uh, you cannot use it for anything. You can't cut with it. The only thing you can do with the one I made was sand. Okay. Um, you have to uh, understand that. I just, uh, three quarter inch uh, plywood would be a much, much better uh, material if you're doing any kind of cutting at all. And uh, I'm looking at this. I can't cut three quarter with my laser, but <laughs> I'm thinking I can at least do a half inch plywood uh, with my laser, so I I may try that. Well, you could uh, you score the is, surface with the laser and then follow it up with a scroll saw. No, what you should do is use the laser to create. You put a bushing in your router, and use the laser to cut your template that the bushing will follow. There you go. There you go. Yeah, and you, you could use that quarter inch acrylic to uh, again just you, just to just just put the put the bushing so the bushing rides inside the groove on the acrylic. That's exactly what I did. I uh, actually used nylon bushings on all the bolts, and right. um, then I used the vinyl tubing for the um, the padding on the outside. Right. Uh, Joe, did you put washers behind between yeah. the wood and the rubber? Yes, there's uh there's washers on both sides. Okay, just so, regular steel washers, eh? Regular steel washers, uh, wing nuts on the the other side. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the only you know you you pointed out that the the arcs extend a little bit far to the center. The only problem with the wing nuts is if you're making the smallest ball possible with this, it'd be the the wing nuts interfere with. Uh, the uh, the monster faceplate that I used. Yeah. So you'd have to replace those probably, um, you know, just with regular regular nuts. So I made a set of uh, extension jaws for my cold jaw, Chuck, and um, they're about probably two or three inches past the cold jaw chucks, and um, I don't like it. It's not <laughs> flexible enough. You know, it's only you only got it in an inch or so of, of, of bowl size, you know, to grab with it, and um, it was a way. It took me as much time to make that as I think it would to make this. Uh, yeah. It was a total waste of time. So if anybody's thinking about that, I would, I would go towards this method because, this you don't have to take those things in and out every time. You just spin yeah. it and you're done. Yo, what, what's the, the, uh, that's a really nice big faceplate that's probably a 50 70 dollar faceplate there isn't it it came with came with my lathe so okay <laughs> yeah, i would make a wooden faceplate and tap it so that you, you basically yeah don't need so so i actually i have a tap for for that i just didn't know if it would be strong enough using yeah. using wood that was well you got something that big it's pretty i mean it's even a 
uh, 15 and a half inches or whatever to yeah. three quarter. I mean, that's a fair amount of weight spinning around. There. Yeah. And the bumpers, they, they kind of make these noises while it's spinning around it. So oh, they it sort of makes you wonder if something's going to fly off at any minute. <laughs> Yeah. The other, uh, going back to something we discussed earlier, the uh, close center like that, uh, the combination of the inner and outer plate, I think would really uh, provide more strength there. So I really don't think the small diameter is going to be a problem. No, uh, no an inch and a half of plywood is pretty stout. So. Right. All right. Uh, anybody else have any other final comments here or thoughts, suggestions? Was a helpful evening for you? Very helpful. I was going to make one other comment. Uh, somebody remarked about how expensive uh, vacuum chucks are. Uh, I bought two of them, a large one and a small one. And the small one was a little too big for some of the things I turned. So I took a couple pieces of waste wood tap them with the one by eight uh, tap that I bought. I think that's uh, Woodcraft. And then uh, you just use a, a uh, cutoff tool to cut a channel of whatever diameter you want. And they sell that rubber tubing stuff that you put into that channel. And so I now have a selection of very inexpensive uh, vacuum chucks. I want to try that. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, I use fun foam from Michael's for my gaskets. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll have to do, we'll do another, uh, we're probably to the point where I did a, uh, a demo three or four years ago now on vacuum chucks. We're probably at a point where we could do another breakout session on that. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind. All right, so I appreciate everyone's participation uh, tonight. Um, it, uh, let me stop sharing here. There we go. Um, and uh, we will see you next week. Get your, uh, get your items in for show and tell. And uh, we'll see you next week. Steve, how are we doing the judging? Um, uh, Norm, I'll get with you and Ted, and we will do it and let people know who wins. I actually, thanks for reminding, I forgot about it, but I will, we'll, we'll announce it next week. Okay. But we got all the slides, so we can, we can see. Good job. Right. Good show. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thanks, yep. everyone. We'll thanks, everybody. You. Thanks, Terry, for joining us. See you next week. Hey, thank you. Thanks, all. Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care.